And there's a whole generation, a whole group of both customers and agents coming into the contact center. And how are we planning for that? How are we cha uh, planning for that shift? So these are some of the things that, you know, at a broad level, at a macro level are changing, but that impact how we do business every day inside the contact center. And how, how are those changes being manifested in the contact center? So notice the date here, 2014. This is great data that's gathered on a regular basis from Dimension Data. So Dimension Data is a global systems integration firm that um, distributes and, and supports the contact center solutions of many vendors, including Ainge House. But this was a, a snapshot in 2014 based on survey data from, as you can see here, over 800 global contact center managers like yourself. And the questions that they asked was, what channels are being managed in your contact center? Okay. And not surprising, you know, 95% of all centers were using, were, were taking telephone calls, and email and IVR were very high in terms of um, being used in the various centers. And when I would speak to this slide two years ago, um, you know, it was about how many channels and the adoption of channels. But the change from 2014 to 2015 in that same data from Dimension Data was pretty dramatic. And let me sort of highlight from this slide what I'm talking about. Look at the green portion of the, the inner circle here, which is 2006. As I said, Dimension Data has been collecting this data for 10 years now. And so in 2006, as you see, better than 90% of all interactions were coming either from the telephone or from IVR. Okay? Jump out to 2013 and look at the decreasing amount of green in that second circle and the increasing amount of email and web chat and social media and SMS and, and other types of internet peer-to-peer -peer systems. Then in 2015, again, a dramatic change in how much green, you know, sort of voice and IVR centric interactions are coming into a center versus these new digital channels. And the conclusion that Dimension Data made is 10 years ago, there was no web chat, smartphone application, social media, and, and very little email. Today, and this was 2015, digital interactions account for over 35% of all of the interactions coming into a contact center. And at the current rate, will overtake voice in just one year's time. So their prediction last year is that this is the year, 2016, is the watershed year when the proportion of interactions coming into contact center will tip that balance from voice to digital interactions. So that's why we're here, right? That's one of the reasons that you took the time to get on the phone today, because this change, while coming rather slowly over the last 10 years, is suddenly upon us and suddenly um, an area that requires more attention than it did perhaps two or three years ago. That proportion of digital interaction has grown steadily and at current rates will overtake agent assisted by the end of 2016. So this is data that I think complements the dimension data um, statistics really well. Uh, CFI Group is a consulting firm um, based out of the University of Michigan. It's the same company that is responsible for um, an index you may have heard of, the American Custom. Uh, uh, consumer Satisfaction Index um, that rates contact center customer satisfaction. Right? And the, their data here shows that when it comes to telephone and, and web self-service, first contact resolution success rates have been pretty high. You know, 78%, 65%. These are, are not bad statistics for first call, first contact resolution. As an industry, though, where we're not doing as well is in these newer digital interaction types. Chat, 46%. Email, 41%. And again, one of the reasons we're here, because as, a, as an industry, we've done voice for 30, 35 years. I know. I've been here for most of those. Um, 
but online chat, email, these are newer types of interactions and we don't quite have the processes and in place the same way and that's what we need to work on as, a, as an industry. So I'm going to turn this over to Scott and he is going to give us a poll question at this point. Great. So what we want to do is ask you, please select all the channels you're currently using today. As you heard uh, Sheila go through the channels and, and how we're moving away from uh, an only voice-centered customer service environment, uh, go ahead and let us know what you're using and go ahead and select multiple uh, as most of you are probably using multiple uh, channels today. Now whether or not they're connected into a uh, one omni-channel type environment, uh, that's, a, that's what we'll be addressing today, but we'll go ahead and allow uh, a few more seconds for everyone to vote. We have uh, the strong majority coming up here, but uh, votes are still coming in rapidly. All right, looks like votes have slowed down at this point. We have a large audience, so it's taking a bit longer than normal, so I apologize for the delay, but we'll go ahead and close the poll. And here are the results. Of course, most everyone is using voice uh, The second at 95%. The second runner-up is email at 89%, uh, also a very common channel. Uh, and then next we have but web submissions with with 74 percent, a close next with 61 percent, and chat uh, becoming more and more common, and then social media a little bit higher than I anticipated at 53 percent. Uh, John and Sheila, what kind of commentary do you have for this? Well, I'd come back that it's very close. Sorry, Sheila, very close to your stats, right? I mean, I think the especially for voice and email, and. Uh, Maybe chat and website, social media, maybe a little higher than you had for your overall market trend. Would you agree with that? Yes, and so that you know, let me reinforce that the data that I discussed from Dimension Data is global, and we probably don't have quite a global audience. Probably North American here, so this may slant a little bit more uh, to a North American audience. I'm I'm with you, Scott. Social media um, higher than I thought. I think. When social media first started, I, I think maybe four or five years ago, there was a lot of discussion about bringing social media into the contact center. And it was almost like one of those, uh, those waves where there's a, a, a big hype and then a, a, a period of disillusionment with social media. And I think over the last 12 to 18 months, we've seen it stabilize where people are big and companies are beginning to understand that there's value in keeping track of those social media interactions and that it's not all, all about um, preventing a negative. There's a lot of positive wow experiences that come with, you know, with attention to social media. So uh, I'm actually pleased to see the, the high level of social media there. That's hey Sheila, did you, did, did you see the, um, that originally when social media start, started becoming prevalent as a channel, it was still kind of in people's marketing departments, and then over time, it's moved more and more into into the contact center. Have you have you noticed I, that? Yeah, I think one of the the corollary uh, trends is social media being used in the CRM application, right? So, right. right. So once we tied it to the CRM application, then I think that tighter integration to the contact center happened. Uh, but I don't disagree that it was in the marketing department, that, but as volume is built, it makes more sense to bring it to the place that does a better job of queuing and reporting um, on, the, on the interactions. So we're going to move on. Um, so, you know, we talked about 2014, you know, a look at contact centers, looked at various channels that companies were using. We just looked at various channels. What's changed into 2015 and now into 2016 is a recognition that nobody's using just one channel, right? That, you know, this this is a, you know, a, a map, you know, Airzat's map, right? That shows that, that, cus that consumers, be they, you know, uh, consumers or, or business users are, when they, by the time they get to the contact center, 
they've probably taken two, three, four, five steps on their way to the contact center trying to get their issue resolved. I mean, increasingly, as we know, and we, we all know this from even what we do, picking up the phone and calling a company to place an order or to resolve a customer service issue is rarely the first choice of anyone anymore. The question is, do your contact center policies and procedures recognize that fact? Do you equip your agents with knowledge of the other possible interactions that may have happened two minutes ago, or three days ago, or as, as long ago as a month ago, right? Um, to the extent that we can do that, we provide context to the agent that helps get that first call resolution that we see as an issue with email and, and web chat to higher levels. So I'm going to turn this over to John so he can talk about some of the solutions that Angehouse has for addressing this customer journey, this, this notion that customers aren't just calling into us and starting from scratch. It's not single interaction one at a time, but understanding that your customer is in a journey and, and equipping the agent with that knowledge. Thanks, Sheila. Yeah, we, we thought it would be beneficial to kind of bounce back and forth between showing you guys where we thought the market was going and, and as Sheila said, you know, a customer is following a journey with you to get their problem solved or their, their order placed or whatever it might be and then how we would actually represent that in an application. So Enchouse, we're a vendor of omni-channel solutions. We provide the technologies that enable the omni-channel experience. Part of that is this journey view. So what we're seeing here and you can kind of see it close to the top of the screen there is a film strip view of all of the interactions that the customer has had with the service organization, with the contact center, in almost historical order going from most recent to oldest. And you can see there that it includes both active interactions, which are the ones that are happening potentially right now, maybe somebody waiting in queue, or somebody that's been reserved, you know, for say uh, an agent that has a relationship with that customer, or someone that's, you know, may maybe that's already in progress. Maybe there's an in progress call or email or whatever that's happening right now. And then, as you go to the right, you can see the historical interactions. It gives the agent that context, allows them to open something up that may have already happened. If I'm on a call with a customer and they tell me they've already e emailed me about the issue last week, I can quickly go back, see that email, and bring the two interactions together into one experience for that customer. So that's nice because that agent having that whole context lets them understand the history and understand how best to deliver the, uh, the value to the customer. So you know that's the journey, and that's, that's the visual representation of that. So thanks, John. I, I think what's what's interesting here is, you know, if one looks at the, um, you know, the business press, the customer experience press, you hear about customer journey mapping and customer journey analytics, and I think something like this screen reinforces the fact that you don't have to have a big million-dollar analytics project to start uh, equipping your agents to have a better context of a customer journey. Um, that yes, you know, million dollar analytics projects are great in terms of, you know, take, you know, uh, taking every single interaction and analyzing it and understanding every single step. Um, but one can start with customer journey um, with a lot less investment in, in effort and, and, and expense. And I think the first step in customer journey is just recognizing that it is a journey, that, you know, that it's a philosophy that you bring to your contact center management. That you say, we're not here to answer phone calls or respond to emails. We're here to help a customer who's on a journey get to the end of that journey. And just that recognition, just that philosophy, I think, is a great first step. And a great second step is what I think Engehouse is showing here, being able to show the data that is collected by the contact center system, the emails, the chats, um, things that are in progress, um, 
is that everything that that customer may have done? Not necessarily, but it's a step toward that, right? Did that customer walk into a retail store? Perhaps, are we gathering that here? Not necessarily, but whatever context we give to the, end, to the agent is much more than we, they've, they've seen in the past. And so, as I said, I think it's a journey um, for the contact center as well as for the customer, and you don't have to do everything at once, but you can start with easier steps the philosophy step, and then just showing the last few interactions that have gone through the contact center. So I think one of the reasons that customers are on a journey, it has to do with this notion of the death of brick and mortar stores. Does this apply to your business? If you sell movies, books, music, if you're in education or hospital services, if you're in transportation, any of these vertical markets have had an impact on the product design, delivery, and sales support as a result of digital transformation. So the question is, does your contact center reflect those changes? Do you incorporate things that are required for, for, to, to support the business that your company may now be in that's different than the business that they were in 10 years ago? Do you support your, your, your business you know, as well if they have no factory as, as if they had a factory? You know, where, you know, it, when the people had a factory, everything sort of came to one place and was shipped from one place. And that's just not the world anymore. But is that the world your contact center was built for? You know, this, this notion of the death of brick and mortar is influenced by mobility. Right? The, the smartphone has really changed everything. Um, the things that we used to do by walking into a store or traveling to something, so much of that now can be done with a smartphone. Voice, text, email, apps, web. I, it was curious, one of my analyst colleagues posted a blog last night that amused me but also is so on point to this discussion, which is, you know, he works from home and he, he wrote a blog that was entitled, Do You Want to Go Out With Me? And the, 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 the gist of the, the blog was, I don't go out for anything anymore. I don't go out for movies because I'm more comfortable in my own home. I don't go out for food because somebody will bring it. I don't go out to work because I can work from home. Um, and it really reinforced from, to, to, to me how smartphone technology, mobile technology has really changed the way that we live. But again, we come back to this notion of have we changed the way that we support customers who live in this world? And live in it we do. You know, mo your mobile phone has become the one constant in your life. From the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to sleep, your mobile device is always with you. You know, you access different types of media during the day, uh, but it's that mobile device that ties everything together. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, everybody can be a sample of one with this. I mean, you know, waking up, the first thing you do is check your email, and unwinding at night, the last thing I do is, is listening to an audio book to put me to sleep. Um, but it's true for so much of uh, the population right now. And it's not about just saying, oh, mobility, you know, everybody's got a smartphone, so um, we need to have a better sense of mobile applications. Mobility is really driving consumer behavior, and this is, you know, just you know, one stat of any number that I could put up here. But 60% of consumers who use their smartphones to research decisions when they're in a store make a purchase at the store, um, and then 35% ultimately purchase something online. So 95% of the time, if you're doing something on your mobile phone, you are you have a sense of urgency. You're going to do something. It's not just about, um, you know, uh, scanning the web and, and looking at pages. When you're on your mobile phone, there's a very good chance you're about to go ahead and make some kind of a, uh, a purchase decision. So what does that mean in the, in the contact center world? Well, I think one of the things we need to do is a better job of integrating mobile applications with the contact center. I think you know, if we had a question here that said, how many of your companies, of the people who are listening here, have a mobile application, I'm sure we'd get pretty high percentage. 
If we then said, what percentage of you integrate that information to the contact center agent, that's where I think our percentages would fall apart. Because too often, um, those two operations, mobile and contact center, are not well integrated at a business level. You know, mobile is done by one organization and contact center by another. But hopefully one of the messages that we're sending here today is that an integration of that context is going to do a much better job for your agents in terms of helping them understand the journey your customers are on and how to get to that resolution of the journey for the customer. Uh, here I've just you know, picked a few industries and the types of applications that are increasingly found on the mobile apps. You know, for insurance, photos for reporting claims, uh, medical coverage questions, validations, um, you know, think about reporting claims, you know, for, from an insurance point of view for, for cars. Again, those applications exist. Probably in insurance, they're doing a pretty good job of getting those pictures to agents, right? In travel, you know, the ability to route, um, you know, high value frequent flyers. Um, but again, you know, I, I travel quite a bit. I have these applications on my on my smartphone. I've, I don't think I've ever had a situation where I've been, you know, working on something in an application and had to call the airline or hotel, and that airline or hotel had any idea that I had just been on their mobile application. I mean, that's what we're heading toward. You know, service providers with billing and devices and, and, and assistance, financial. I mean, financial is huge with respect to um, authentication. I mean, nothing is worse than going through all of the authentication on a mobile phone and then trying to call and having to authenticate all over again. Um, these are the kinds of things that we're doing a much better job on in terms of creating the solutions. We no, now need to take those next steps and start uh, integrating those. Because the other thing that's happening with mobility is consumers want to do more self-service. I mean, there's lots of statistics, I don't even have to offer them to you, that consumers and business customers would rather get the answer themselves, go to a website, check the shipping date, check to see where an order is, then speak to somebody to get the same information. Now, I'm not one who's saying that everything should move toward self-service, but you know, uh, customers should always have the opportunity to talk to a live agent if they want to. What I am saying is I think we could do a better job as an industry thinking about the world like this. You know, back in the 90s, it was all about doing a better job with assisted service, um, creating skills-based routing, creating workforce management that scheduled better, right? In the 2000s, I think we had a, a better recognition that self-service um, could not just decrease costs, but give consumers faster answers to simple questions, right? I think, you know, in this decade, bringing those two together, assisted self-service and self-service is the dream, right? Bringing those two together in a way that defines a better customer experience that may in fact mean no contact resolution. Not one contact, not first contact, but no contact. And that happens when the self-service alternatives are strong enough that nobody has to be contacted, that the consumer doesn't have to call the contact center and the contact center doesn't have to call the consumer. So this is sort of the, the way that customer experience is moving, you know, blending of assisted and self-service to create, you know, the, the perfect kind of customer experience. And I'm going to turn it over to John to talk a little bit about what some of the things that they're doing that support these concepts. Yeah, but before before I show you a couple of screens here, I had a, an experience just yesterday. Um, I was traveling from New Zealand back to Chicago and I had a very tight connection in San Francisco and I made the flight but my bag did not. So immediately, I mean it was amazing, when I landed in Chicago uh, I had a text on my mobile telling me that the bag didn't make it with a little button to click, little link to click that took me to a little scheduling app that allowed me to schedule a home delivery of my bags uh, and it was all done without any human interaction. It was actually an awesome experience for losing your bag, you know, for, for a brief period of time 
it was it was an awesome experience and it just struck me how amazing it was and then this morning my, when the bag actually got delivered to my home the the guy the transportation driver was using a mobile application because he in turn you know GPS the 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 parent company knew where he was knew you know how he was doing on his route and could keep track of him that way and then of course he could say confirmation when the bags were delivered and, and so on so it's just it's just become a reality it's become um, an incredible part of our of our daily lives now and we're, we're, we're getting very very used to it so I'll show you a quick example of some some of what our technology can do here's an example Sheila brought up financial services applications here's an example of what you could do potentially with financial services if you if you click here, you know, through the mobile app now, you no longer have to wait, you know, through wait through painful IVR menus, you know, to get your account balance. You can get it online, and of course, you can get it on your mobile device with an online connection. And then once you're in there, you know, click through and get detailed information. But the key that we found is always providing a way to get to a live person if you need help. So in this case, I'm looking at a savings account. Maybe I'm not happy with my account balance, or I want to move funds in there, or I want to do something else, maybe a little fancier. I can click a button, get put into queue, see my wait time displayed visually, uh, potentially navigate through other data while I'm waiting. It's much less painful than it was when we were dealing with a voice IVR, but it's still tied to those contact center queues. It's still tied to getting me to the right agent to solve my problem. And then it's still tied to having that agent see the context of where I was. And, you know, when we talk about omni-channel, it's all about journey and context. Where did I come from? What was I trying to accomplish? And making sure the agent has all that information at their fingertips. Absolutely. So you had a great example there of no contact resolution not having to get in a line to report your bag was missing. Great. Um, and also then seeing um, mobile integration, right? And I, th I think with the, the case that you talked about of, of your, your driver having a mobile application um, blends nicely with the, the using mobility inside the contact center. It's not just about consumers calling in or customers calling in. It's also what we can do for our supervisors and managers from a mobile application standpoint. I mean, think about the days not that long ago when the only way to get a report from a contact center was to be physically located with it, right? To be able to take the data straight from the system. Now we have, you know, the ability like this young lady here to have a, a smartphone device, a, a tablet device that can help us keep track of SLAs, uh, how services are doing, how agents are doing, to be able to compare between real and planned indicators, to manage schedules, to, to actually make changes to agent assignments and to routing in real time as conditions change. Um, you know, to be, to, for that supervisor to be able to do that regardless of where she is or where he is, uh, not to be limiting on it. Um, so I, again, I think that Inchouse has some uh, some technology here that uh, John is going to tell you about. We do. So imagine what what that supervisor could see on her tablet. And though in this case, we have an application called Touchpoint, which works for both agents and supervisors, and enables people to see the statistics, what's going on in the contact center right now. So. No longer is the supervisor tied to her desk. She can wander around, go to meetings, um, go on a break, go to lunch, and still see what's going on in real time. You know, in this case, we're looking at a particular agent, um, but she can see all the agents that report to her and their stats. And then the other thing that we wanted to make sure that, you know, which supervisors demand, is that when they do see something occurring, they can take action. So the application has to be actionable where let's say they see that all of a sudden nobody's logged into a queue or the number of agents logged into a queue has gone down to just a couple and they know their service levels are going to start to drop. 
they can reach in and assign more people to that queue. Or let's say they see an agent in trouble. An agent raises his or her hand and says, I need help. The supervisor can see that on the tablet and monitor the conversation, listen in, barge into the conversation, redirect the call, what, whatever that, that action might be can be accomplished from a mobile device. So again, it's, it's, it's all about mobility, as Sheila's been saying, and you know, being able to not only see what's going on, but act on it in real time. So one of the things that I, that I think is interesting about this slide is how different it is from the reports that would have been available even as recently as five years ago. Um, you know, I, I made the note here. Remember when we were looking at, at, at contact center reports that were green bar coming off a, a daisy chain printer, whatever the heck they were called. I mean, now just like mobile applications, contact center supervisor applications are built for the millennial user, the, the mobile application user that we have all become. Which, which brings me to sort of a next topic here of you know, I, I, I bridged this topic of millennials, right? And as, as a boomer, as a proud boomer, um, I think it's interesting to look at the generational demographics of the workforce. So this is, is a data from AARP. And as you can see, based on relatively recent data, the biggest generation in the workforce right now is, in fact, the boomers. Um, partially because we just won't go away, but you know, as much as, or as important as millennials are, those born after 1980, um, what we really have in the workforce, and I'm sure that, you know, and, and we've seen data that, that this reflects what's in the contact center as well, is a very multi-generational workforce, right? You know, if you looked 30 years ago, you would not see as many 50 to 60 year olds in the workforce because people retired more succinctly, you know, at, you know, my dad and, and his generation, you know, retired at 55 to 58. Um, baby boomers are holding on well into their 60s. And so what we have is a, is a workforce that is very diverse. So as much as people talk about millennials, um, and, you know, uh, fairly, I'm sure, um, the, the challenge for a contact center management is to have systems in place for the training and management of a workforce that is quite diverse. And so I think one of the, the key solutions that contact centers are working uh, on these days that I think supports this generational view is, is one that John's going to tell you about now. Yeah, how do, you, how do you solve the problem of making an agent productive? You know, that that's the age-old question. And I think, you know, there, there, there's a lot of statistics, too, and I, Sheila, I'm sure, can speak to this as well, with, um, with attrition of agents in contact centers. It's a, it's a tough job. Um, it's not always the most rewarding job. We, we try to make it rewarding for our agents, but, you know, it, it is the case that we're seeing a fair a fairly high attrition rate of agents in contact centers. I've, I've seen statistics as high as an average of 25-27% of agents leave their jobs every single year. So if you think about that, how do you keep your agents uh, knowledgeable? How do, you re how do you train new agents and make them productive as quickly as possible? One approach to that is to give them knowledge, right? to give them access through the, through the technologies that we've become accustomed to, Google-style searching of articles and so on, to bring up the information they need at their fingertips to best solve the customer's problem and to, to, to deliver what Sheila was talking about earlier, first contact resolution, which is a key metric being measured today. How do you do that? So first, maybe you provide knowledge management to your customers through a website so they can do the searching, but in the event they're having trouble, the agent can see the article the customer was looking at and can go from there and help them with a search and get to the information they need and maybe even through collaboration tools tap into an expert and bring that person into the conversation. There's all kinds of ways to do it but the key to it is making sure the agents have the right knowledge at their fingertips. So, um, I, I think one area so when I, when I see this knowledge management, um, you know, one point that I'll make is 
with with the boomers, I think there's um, sometimes an issue of retention of information and being able to quickly bring to mind the answer to a question. Supporting agents with knowledge management is not just great in terms of, of, of customers and, and having a single um, answer to any question regardless of channel, but it's also supporting your workforce and allowing them to mature in their jobs. They have great skills, um, but supporting the, the needs that they have. Just as you know, boomers may have sort of memory issues, and I certainly, my memory is not what it was, I think one issue for millennials um, is this notion of phone skills. So I remember about a year ago seeing a blog by a 34-year-old entrepreneur, 20 things that 20-year-olds don't get. Pick up the phone. Stop hiding behind your computer and smartphone. Business gets done on the phone and in person. You know, those of us who've been around for a while know how true these statements are. But those kids looking at their smartphones who don't want to pick up the phone, not only do they not want to, they don't necessarily have great voice skills. You know, sometimes I, I have a 19-year-old nephew living in the house, and I, obviously he's, he's like the, the picture here, doesn't want to call anybody to begin with. But even when he does, not as clear as he could be. You know, bright kid, sophomore in college, but not as, as concise and as clear getting his message across. And once again, just like with knowledge management, perhaps being something that could support, you know, boomers and other agents as well, there are technologies that can help with this phone skills issue. And John's going to talk a little bit about it. Yeah, there are. So thanks, Sheila. So th I think uh, where millennials might be really good at text-based communication, perhaps better than the boomers um, at that. You know, and, and, and as such, we can assign them those tasks within the contact center, handling text communications with customers, handling written communications. You know, how do you, how do you en enable someone to be better on the phone? Of course, this is cross-generational. We can all use better coaching when we're, when we're having conversations with customers. One approach is speech analytics, and, and this, is, this is a bit of a cutting-edge technology. You know, it's kind of at the at the leading edge of what's being done today, um, but we're seeing a growing number of contact centers starting to adopt this. The idea is, and you're seeing a little little strip of of uh, user interface down there on the left hand side, showing you a way of keeping an agent on script. You know, actually listening into the conversation through automation and detecting whether the agent greets the customer in the appropriate way, says the right things, um, maybe does this week's promotion, you know, says says the promotion they're supposed to say as part of a part of the script, and maybe even detects whether they're saying bad things. You know, did they mention the name of the competitor's product? They shouldn't have done that. You know, things like that. Uh, keeps them on on script, but also measures some what we call soft evaluation things. And Sheila, if you show the next screen, these are some of the things that, you know, basically we can listen in and detect. Is the agent saying the right things? Is the agent, um, is the customer saying yes or to the agent's questions, which is an important thing to detect? Is the agent speaking clearly? Is the agent speaking loudly enough? Is the customer stressed or sounding stressed or the agent sounding stressed? when they're on the conversation? Is the agent interrupting the customer when the customer is trying to speak? You know, is, is everything in the conversation very clear, including the quality of the voice? Um, is the agent letting the customer speak? You know, there all those kinds of things and can be detected now automatically and reported back to the agent in real time to alert them that they may be in violation of a certain certain metric but also reported back to managers and supervisors, either in real time or after the fact. So the supervisor can interrupt or come into a conversation and or the manager later can coach the agent to do better. So there's a lot of ways that these kinds of technologies can be used to improve the quality of, of spoken communications. I love the one on tempo of speech. As a, as a New Yorker, it's something I have struggled with through my career to make sure I don't speak too quickly. 
Um, so I, I'd love to have an indicator telling me I'm going too fast. <laughs> but I think now we're going to turn it over to Scott for a second poll question. That is correct. I'm going to switch to the poll side and I'll pop this up. There we go. All right. Uh, which of these emerging technologies do you think would be most valuable to your business? Uh, we talked about a lot of different uh, additional components to help you stay up with the, the customer who is usually on the technology side far more advanced than what the contact center or, or customer service center uh, can handle at this moment or at least are trying. So if you could go ahead and select all, all that apply to where you think you uh, should be spending some of your time or what you are looking at uh, as a business here. Um, on the vocal coach note, uh, before queuing a, a voice interaction to an agent, you could possibly ask the requirement of, did you have to talk to a parent before reaching your date or your friend when calling them? <laughs> that you have a certain level of professionalism even at, uh, as a teenager to, to get through that barrier. <laughs> that usually kills a live audience on the webinar, it's a little bit harder. All right, we'll go ahead and wait just a few more seconds. All right, looks like the majority of everyone has voted. I'll go ahead and close the poll. And showing the results, the clear leader is mobile app integration to the contact center. Uh, I think that reflects a lot of times where the, the mobile app technology and, and development does not start with the contact center. The contact center is an afterthought of that. So uh, probably no surprise there, especially in the B2C environment. And then a, a lot of ties that were ranging from about 40 to 50% for knowledge management, speech analytics, vocal coaching. So uh, John and Sheila, what do you think of this? I'm going to go first this time, John. Um, I, I'm pleasantly surprised to see the mobile app integration really hit people. Uh, you know, hopefully, as part of this conversation, um, this a, a raised recognition that integrating those two is so so core to doing a better job with uh, managing customer journeys. I think when I, when I look at the vocal coaching and that com coming in at 33%, probably newer um, for most people. You know, hadn't seen that kind of technology before. And so not as high on their list, but certainly something to think about and keep in the, in the back of your head as you go forward. John. Yeah, I'm, I'm encouraged by this as well. I, I think um, the mobile app integration to the contact center is something that um, we were initially worried that businesses might, might miss, that they might see the mobile app as, as a panacea, you know, that, that all their customers could be served through the mobile app and not need need that integration to contact center. We also, for a while, saw a number of mobile apps maybe simply have a phone number to dial if you needed to get to a contact center, and that defeats somewhat the purpose of being able to convey that context through to the agent, because the customer would have to then repeat themselves over the phone. Uh, so it's it's really encouraging to see that that integration, and I'm, I'm encouraged by the, the other stats as well. There's some some real interest in some of these growing and emerging technologies. So, thanks, Sheila. Absolutely. So, you know, sort of our, our wrap-up thought for you, um, to deliver the same excellence to digital interactions that you bring to voice today. A new way of, of thinking about the contact center and what we have done so well for so long and making sure we, we set the bar just as high for digital interactions. And and this this last quote so resonates with me as somebody who used to, you know, I started my career um, in the sales force for AT&T um, and, and very often you talk to a company and they say, well, we don't want to change anything. Everything's working fine. Um, and an executive once uh, was quoted saying this and I, it really resonates for me. Too many businesses are serving today's consumers using yesterday's technology out of fear that an IT disruption will negatively affect their service operations. The reality is that they may already be risking customer relationships 
through inconvenient and high effort experiences. So th that fear of change may be holding you back and, and creating more issues than the change itself would cause. So I'm going to turn it back to, John, uh, to, uh, to Scott and he is going to handle the Q&A for us. Hopefully uh, ask us some tough questions. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for that great insight there, Sheila and John. So we'll jump into our questions. Uh, the first one, I'll direct this one towards Sheila. What is a good first step in moving towards omnichannel? So I think one of the things we talked about is that a lot of companies are doing email, doing web chat, maybe doing social media, um, but not doing it in an integrated way in their contact center. I think very often uh, things like email handling or web chat handling might have been given to a third party, might have been uh, being accomplished do, using a different software system. I think the, the state of the art today is you want as much of those interactions being managed in one place so that you do have that context, so that you can put in front of an agent the, the different channels that a customer may have been using. So I think the first step is to look at your operation and say, do we have some silos and how do we bring those under a single umbrella so that we support the agent with the full context of a customer's journey? Yeah, that's great. Um, John, as a technology provider, uh, where are you seeing the most use of Omnichannel? Uh, good question. So I, I think a few years ago, um, it was kind of about picking the right channel for best conveying the information. So say you got a call and the customer was asking for some piece of complex information that you already had access to through a knowledge article or some file that had instructions or something like that. You could just attach it to an email, send it to the customer, you basically joined two, two communications channels together, a call and, and an email, because that was the best way to convey the information. Now I think we're seeing this connection between the mobile interaction and the live contact, which could still be text-based or voice, but, but it you know, connects the mobile. And then there's a classic where in like help desks now, we're seeing people start with maybe an instant message. So instead of calling your help desk to get your PC fixed or your phone fixed or whatever, you just text message into a queue. It gets put in queue just like a call would, delivered to the right skilled agent. And then that agent determines, well, wait, I want to escalate this to a call or maybe a screen sharing session to gain control of your PC and make the change. And so I'm transitioning channels in that way. So it's become seamless, uh, but it kind of depends on, on the application. But we're seeing quite a, quite a number of different approaches to it. Great. Uh, and I'll just state now a lot of questions are coming in, so if we don't get to yours, uh, we will address it afterwards here uh, in, in an email form. In the retail industry, are today's omnichannel customers less loyal to one particular brand than they used to be? And I might add, how could the contact center impact that? But are customers in the retail industry less loyal uh, than they used to be? Are you directing that to what? I'll take it. And then, John, if you have some uh, additional comments. You know, it's interesting. It, when, when I saw the question come in, I really think that this notion of journey impacts this question. And if you think about... Uh-oh. If you think about the journey being um, all the way to getting your solution, you know, getting your product, it's not just about um, going into a store, seeing something, and buying it, right? Today it's more about what's the fastest way to get something at the best price, right? So it's the entire customer journey from um, looking at different solutions as well as getting it delivered. And the reason I bring this getting delivered up is something like Amazon, right? Um, and I, I think that's where you are seeing less loyalty. I, you know, I, I think we're seeing less loyalty because Amazon has set a, a new bar. Um, I can get a great price 
if I wait 24 hours or 48 hours? Is that am I willing to do that? So I think the the answer for the retail industry is to make sure that they're supplying enough added value um, and and maybe at an immediacy factor um, above and beyond what some of these you know um, online manuf you know online services are offering. What are your thoughts, John? Yeah, I would agree, Sheila. I, I, um, I, one of your fellow analysts in our space told me about his daughter not too long ago, where his daughter, who's a millennial, by the way, um, is is has a habit of getting online and looking at different vendors' prices for an item that she's interested in, and depending on the price points and such, she might actually start up multiple web chats with multiple vendors simultaneously and effectively try to get the best price by having them provide her pricing and then web chat into another vendor. Well, I just got this price. Can you beat it? And literally have kind of a bake-off in, in real time through various retailers for a given item that she's looking at. It's amazing to me. Well, but I, I think you answered the question there that, that loyalty has declined. But it's a function of the, the I think the entire journey, not just uh, choosing a solution and getting a price. Yeah, I would agree. All right, thank you. Um, Sheila, what is the impact to call volumes in contact centers that introduce omnichannel processes? Well, it's interesting. You know, if you had asked me that question three years ago, the answer pretty uniformly was that it isn't impacting voice volumes, that voice volumes continue to rise at a reasonable rate. But I think in those the intervening three years, and, and you know we pointed to it here about the, the mobile channels, um, I think we are finally seeing a decline in voice channels. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, I, I don't think it portends the death of the contact center because we still need the contact center for things like web chat and to do a good job on email and to be that, um, that source for the mobile customer who can't get their stuff done during self-service. And, and certainly the contact center still needs to be that point where knowledge management systems are built for customers and for agents. So I would say that that omnichannel is finally impacting um, voice volumes. I think we are seeing a decline, and I, th I don't think it's a rapid decline, but I think we've, we've seen over the last three years probably 15% decline across the across the market. Sheila, I would, I would agree. Let me ask you a question, though. I, th I think this is related. Um, is do you think that with the growth of self-service transactions now, that the transactions the agents are getting are getting more complex? Right, because the the customer is able to serve themselves for the simple things. Do you think well, that's and, and obviously, you know, I think that's been true uh, with the IVR for a long time. You know, I mean, think about how IVRs really um, came to prominence. It was things like, did my check clear or is my deposit there? I think what has happened even more so in the last two to three years is a rising level of what can be done in self-service. Right? So things like mobile applications, it's much easier, for example, for me to change my seat on an airline. It's much easier for me to, um, you know, to make a, an online purchase and send it to four different addresses. There's so many things that we used to have to talk to an agent. So I think one of the, the other thing that's happening with self-service is the bar is rising in terms of the complexity of things that can be done with self-service. But to your point, that means the things that are ending up with agents are even more complex than they were before. And that it's interesting. Just today, I um, I reacted to something that um, I got in an email about reducing average handle times. I said that is so not an issue in 2016. I don't even like to see that in print because average holding times may go up. Things are much more complex that agents have to deal with. So if you're still using that metric. You know, it's maybe time to let that one go. Great. Um, what's the best way to get clients on board with omnichannel communications, moving away from the more traditional methods only? And uh, this might be under the assumption that uh, you're leading your customers instead of your customers leading you. But I'll leave that 
on the table there for you. Let me let me take that one real quick. I, I think the best way is to is to guide them and coach them, right? I think we can guide and coach our customers to use omnichannel um, and educate them over time. So let's say a customer is coming into your website having trouble and ends up chatting or talking with your agent. What what better way to to get them more comfortable with your self service engine? than to help them with it rather than just give them the answer to their question. Say, oh, if you look at this page or if you follow this link through or you know, search in this way through our knowledge base, we can get you an answer. And that way the next time they come in, they'll be more likely to, to be able to serve themselves. I, I'd say coach them. Yeah, I mean, I would just a quick follow-up say, the answer is never to block the customer. The answer is never to keep them in the equivalent of voicemail jail or IVR jail. Um, customers always have to have that out. Um, th there's ways to teach them how to use what, what you're making available to them, but it's not forcing them to use it. All right. Uh, this is an interesting one on emerging trends. What are your thoughts on um, video chat and in, in its early adoption of the journey, do you think it will become more prominent channel quickly over the next one to two years? I'm going to take that one. I, the, the word quickly <laughs> doesn't relate to me um, when it comes to, to video. I think what's happening with video is that it is very vertical specific, that it is very use case specific, where it is a good fit uh, it is getting adopted, but I don't I don't see it being very broadly adopted, and I don't see it happening quickly over the next year or two. I think there was a little bit of promise when Amazon put Mayday on their tablets. Turned out they didn't have particularly high usage, and they started dropping it. You know, they didn't put it on their phone, for example. Um, so, as I said, I think in in specific applications and specific verticals, um, it works. But I, I don't think we're seeing anything quick about it. Yeah, I would agree. We're we're seeing it in video kiosking. You know, some you're in a mall and you want to have a video chat with a financial expert through a kiosk or something. It, you know, we're seeing a little bit in healthcare where you get that personal touch when you're talking to a nurse. A nurse. Um, we're seeing it a little bit emerging with a mobile workforce that's performing service in the field where they might want to turn a camera on on their phone say to show an expert in the back office kind of what's going on with a with something they're trying to repair a little bit but you know I think Sheila's I think you're absolutely right I think it is very very dependent on on the use case all right great well we are at the top of the hour so again, thank you to Sheila and John for spending an hour with us to share your insights and knowledge. That was extremely helpful and uh, informational. Thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. Uh, again, the recording and slide deck will be sent out in the days following uh, the close of this event. Thank you and have a great day.